Let's see her up on that. Let's get started with that. What is shame? It's many things and many things to many people. It starts out as a purely biological experience. It turns off our awareness, rephrase. <clears throat> Shame starts out as a physiological reaction. What it does first is it turns off whatever thinking had been going on before. We call it a cognitive shock. Nobody can think clearly in the moment of shame. After that physiologic shock of shame hits, we then begin to think about what triggered it. The more we really pay attention to what triggered the shame, the better we do. Our experiences, however, have taught us that whatever shame points to is not comfortable. So we do our best to evade what that spotlight has evolved to show us. As a result, the way we evade shame becomes our personal definition of shame, and it's different for each one of us. Did it make sense? Because I just read it last week. So can you say anything about the um, evolutionary nature of shame? You say it, it's, a, it's got a, uh, it starts off biological. So um, what, what purpose does it serve the animal us separate from the uh, way that we might interpret it today? Why does it exist? We humans have a number of physiological mechanisms that call our attention to whatever triggered it. Two of these feel good. They're the range of mild interest to wild excitement, the range of contentment to sheer joy. The other affects, one's neutral, the range from surprise to startle, and there are six that feel awful but in different ways. One is fear, which is anxiety, distress, the sobbing affect, anger, go ahead, drop your eyes, that's one, <clears throat> anger, a reaction originally that evolved to protect us from bad food called dismell, reaction to a bad odor, which is this, and disgust, which is a way of avoiding food that tastes bad. And the final affect that evolved, of course, is shame. Well, those two positive affects, interest and contentment to joy, they feel just wonderful. You know, we've all heard about how a deer can get frozen in headlights or a light shined at it. We, they call that jack lighting. And as far as we can tell, the infant can be so fascinated by someone who isn't mother, that he or she, that the baby, loses all sense of what's going on and could be trapped by somebody else. So whenever there's an interference with the experience of those good feelings or of interest or joy, shame seems to come in as a highly amplified interruption of those feelings. In other words, the affect, the physiology of shame, protects us from connection that might be bad for us. <clears throat> so it sounds like you're saying shame has a, is a, um, cuts us out from a connection with One of the most important factors in the evolution of humans is that we've become increasingly connected to each other. Now, lots of life forms are social. 
But no species has taken that social network as seriously and made it as important as us humans. As we humans? No species has made that as important as humans. You see, the more we connect with each other, the more susceptible we are to shame as an interference with that connection. We laugh with each other. If that's interrupted, then we feel this shame. We are interested in each other. If that's interrupted for a moment, we feel this shame. So it's perhaps the most important emotion that's involved in interpersonal interaction. You can't have a society without having mutual interest, mutual joy, and shame. It's probably the most important discomfort in our lives. <clears throat> if something's unclear, ask me to go over it again. I am. <clears throat> Shame is almost um, you're describing it as it, it's not something that uh, it's something that that is a part of our social being. It grows up in the context or it develops in the context of our relationships with the people around us. It's not like um, pain. It's not like the it's not like an other physiological report that's inside the organism. It has to do with a root that's outside the organism with another. You might think that shame has only to do with our connection with other people. But if we're working on a problem, a puzzle, something that interests us, and for the moment we can't figure out what to do, that interruption of how we're interested in something, that interruption triggers this physio physiology of shame. So it doesn't have to be the interruption of the good feeling between one person and another. It can really be just our, the way we focus on whatever interests us or brings us joy and that interruption is amplified as shame physiology, what we call shame affect. It's, it's clear that I can feel that in relation. Do, do I need a self-image? Do I need to... Um, <coughs> other animals that would seem to have fear. Um, even dogs seem to have shame. Where's, where does shame come in in the... Uh, animal evolutionary path to human beings. Obviously, I want to go in a different direction with all this. I'm just playing as we warm up to it and also touching to make sure that we've got this shame defined. Defined and mm -hmm. with many different angles on it. I mean, it seems to be unique. And the, as you mentioned, the latest in the, ev in the mm -hmm. evolutionary process of the affects. Um, and it seems to require it seems to require a relationship to uh, other. Sometimes that other can be my intention internal. Well, it doesn't require attention to another. Doesn't. No, because if you're if you're looking at uh, the printed word and then something is confusing and you can't figure it out, you can just have this moment of deflation. So let, let's, let's work on that. <coughs> it, it helps to look at the physiology of shame. First of all, you'll notice in anybody who's experiencing shame there's a slump of the shoulders, head turns away from what previously had been interesting, and for a moment we just can't think clearly. The face gets red because there's some circulatory uh, mechanisms involved in the skin of the face. 
when we have this feeling of shame, we can't think clearly about the specific thing that had gone on just before. Well, if we've been reading, thinking, studying, even if we're alone, any moment of in clarity, inability to understand, inability to remain connected with the material in front of us, that will produce this affect of shame. We know it best because our connection with people is so important in this human species. We are a very social um, species. However, if you ask about the evolution, we have an idea that life forms that evolved considerably before us don't seem to have shame until they can exhibit rapt interest in, in something. We, we know that there are such things as instincts, and an instinct or a drive is a series of actions undertaken without knowledge or intent why they should be taken. The snake doesn't have to think why it uh, strikes at its target. Birds don't have to think about why they swoop to capture something they declare as food or understand as food. Yet, the more advanced an organism, and the more it has the ability to express <clears throat> animals that can express the affect of interest or the affect of enjoyment are capable of shame. As soon as we evolved these capacities for interest, <clears throat> as soon as we evolved the capacities for interest or joy, we evolved the capacity for shame as a protection against too much of those affects that feel good. When exactly in evolution this occurred, no one's sure. But we do know that the more social a life form, the easier we can, the more, we do know that the more social a life form, the more easily we can identify shame as this slump and turning away. Is part of what um, is kind of keeping groups or packs together, packs of wolves or herds of horses? Or... I don't know any um, any evidence that shame is involved in herd behavior. Um, I do know that. Where humans group, we are likely to have shame as a mechanism that has to do with exclusion or feeling unattached to the group. But whether this occurs in cattle or other animals that will move in herds, I know no evidence for that. It's pretty clear it's happening in primates. That's right. Yeah. I'm just trying to get the point. So rather than thinking of it as, as something that, that, that evolved as having some distinct um, benefit. It's a range of benefits. It's a range of benefits that shame produces. It keeps us from being locked on something where there might be danger for remaining locked. Give me some examples of that. I mean, it's really clear to me that <clears throat> I, I am interested in something, and then something comes up and disrupts that interest, and then I experience shame. Like we're talking about with reading and in other circumstances where I'm entrained, I'm on, and it's not it's not shame that's taking me out. It's some other uh, interrupt, impedance, confusion that's taking me out, and then comes shame, rather than shame being a regulatory. Um, inhibitor of over travel like an interest. Give me an example of that. Uh, 
Around the age of eight months, we notice that the baby has what's been called stranger anxiety. But if you watch the face of the baby, the baby has locked on to another face and then turns away and can cry because it turns out the face isn't mother. So stranger anxiety seems to start as shame from a broken connection and then morph into uh, distress and fear. It's probably visible from the first months of extrauterine life. There have been, there've been experiments done in which babies were exposed to a bunch of flashing lights that they really enjoyed. So they'd focus on the flashing lights. Later, the experimenters changed the situation so that the flashing lights were turned on only after they turned their head three times in a row in one direction, one, two, three. And then they turned on the lights. So fairly quickly, the babies learned to turn their head three times. Then the experimenters let them turn their head three times and didn't give them the reward. So there was an expectation of something positive, something enjoyable, something interesting. And then they frustrated that expectation. And what they saw in a large fraction of the babies was the slump and the head turned away. And this was interpreted by the experimenters, Papushek and Papushek, as shame affect in reaction to the impediment to what had, um, what had previously been interesting. So you wouldn't say in that situation that, that, that um, they were feeling like um, they did something wrong or they didn't do something right, that, that they had learned through the coherent feedback of multiple repetitions of doing my head three times to learn to out, have a certain outcome, and then they start, then, the, then they do it and it's not, and so like I'm doing something wrong. They haven't got to that level of reflexivity that they're making that kind of uh, uh, judgment about themselves or blame of themselves that would lead to shame, but that that shame that you're describing is simply that it didn't happen. In their Let's rephrase what I said about the Papushek and Papushek experiment. <clears throat> <clears throat> The babies developed an expectation that a certain kind of behavior would give them a reward. So we know that they had an expectation of a pleasant experience. When that expectation was frustrated, they experienced shame. And we interpret that as an indication that the positive feeling they had, the interest and anticip and the interest and anticipatory joy, was impeded by the change in the experimental situation. So, no, it, it isn't about. <clears throat> what did you say just a moment ago? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you had a really good point. Well, I mean, sometimes there's this difference between. Um the, the, the shame's coming from uh, some kind of uh, reflect. It's going through some reflection. Got your refl got reflection. All right. <clears throat> There's a lot of debate in developmental psychology about when the infant develops a coherent, a clear sense of self. The work of Daniel Stern a book published in 1985, defined for most of us that the concept of self developed very, very early, and the concept of a reflexive self at maybe around two years. It's at the age, <clears throat> it's at the age of two years that the baby learns to... Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> It's about between 18 and 24 months when 
you can see a certain reaction occur reliably in babies. You can have a baby before 18 months. You can paint on the baby's forehead a red line or a red mark with lipstick. And the baby looks at his or her reflection in a mirror and has no reaction. But at around 18 to 24 months, reliably, the baby has changed enough so that he, she can look at the picture and feel awful, turn away in shame, because there's been a change in my concept of myself. I'm not who I thought I was. I'm different. And um, that's, again, part of, or what we believe is the beginning of a reflexive self system. So the baby at eight months with stranger anxiety, what we would say was stranger shame, that baby doesn't have yet the ability to reflect on, is this me, not me? It's merely the interruption of a good scene or the, anticip the interest in an anticipated good scene. It's the interruption of that we believe, that triggered the moment of physiological shame. So is there a reflexive loop that's forming before we would call it a self-reflexive loop? So that rather than just being this stream and a reaction to the stream, there's a, um, there's a stream and there's some, um, even though there isn't a concept of self, there's some... Um, difference from that stream that the baby or infant um, has as a reference for their experience? I don't think we have to go to that explanation. It's enough, we believe, to say that the good, the anticipated ex good experience or the actual pleasant experience was impeded and then shame affect was triggered. We believe that the physiology of shame is triggered when there's been an interruption to an impediment to a good scene that might have continued if the impediment hadn't occurred. The affect of shame, the physiology of shame, is an amplification of the impediment that makes the impediment very noticeable. We go like this, we can't think, we're slumped. And that makes us think about what triggered the slump and the cognitive shock. That is what I call a spotlight. Each of these nine innate affects is a spotlight that focuses our attention on whatever triggered it. So shame affect focuses our attention on what produced that moment of not being able to think clearly, slump, the hot feeling in the cheek. All those experiences focus the baby, focus the adult on whatever had impeded our ability to remain interested in or happy about some trigger. Now, the face of the other person in the eight month in the eight month um, <clears throat> strangering, the face of the other person in the eight month stranger anxiety is not a bad, scary, or awful face. It remains interesting. But we believe because the baby references everything against internal data, that when the baby references this face against the stored face of mother, then the baby feels a mismatch, and that mismatch triggers shame affect. This is not what I thought I was interested in. The face remains interesting, but now we turn away physiologically. It's not mother. In that sense, it would be clear that the, that the evolutionary purpose of such a mechanism would be to, li to limit um, the, uh, <coughs> interest being used to, to be a bond in, in, with the wrong person. Is this, is this somehow protecting um, the relationship with mom, the primacy of that? You use the term evolutionary purpose, and that, that goes a little bit too close to our idea that um, anything evolved for specific purposes. The, 
the brain, the the mental system, it's too um, plastic for there to be only one purpose of a mechanism. The the mechanism for shame has turned out to be very useful, else life forms, humans and other life forms earlier, would not have maintained shame as an evolutionary um, as an evolutionary acquisition. So it's not the evolved function, or purpose rather, it's not the evolved purpose, it's the evolved function. Better said would be selective pressure. <clears throat> what do you mean by selective pressure? That, um, <clears throat> the, the, the pressure that, uh, that drove an evolutionary selection of a function. That's right. So, yes, it would be human and um, anthropomorphic to come in and talk purpose as a shorthand. Mm -hmm. but, but ultimately, the point is it would be more what is the um, selective pressure driving the uh, emergence and um, stabilization of a particular functionality. Evolutionary theory suggests that any mutation, any change, the appearance of any new ability will be maintained within the species if the new ability increases the probability of survival of the individual animal. Therefore, if, <clears throat> therefore, if the infant is able to detect a change from an expected pattern. When that pat the previous, <clears throat> <clears throat> you think this guy could read from the uh, uh, the screen, you know, the words that have been written for him, but no, he he acts as if he's doing this ad lib. <clears throat> Any acquisition of an attribute, a function, a modality, will be maintained in evolution if it adds to, if it increases our ability to survive. So we believe that shame affect remained part of the human and other animals' repertoire of innate reactions because it turned out to be very useful to react to an impediment to a good scene. It's happened that the more social humans became, there were an increasing number of experiences in which shame got triggered. And all of society is arranged around what we're interested in, what brings us pleasure, joy, and what interferes with interest and joy. Interest, contentment, and shame, the basic forces that bring us together. All right. Go on. Interest, enjoyment, and shame. Three mechanisms that monitor and allow us to... That's the garage Ross is leaving. Okay. It's holding my neck for... That worked against um, survival at one level, at the purely individual level, the teeth, the suffocation, and so forth. But the social power and the um, increased um, viability that came from being able to participate through language in the emerging society just outweighed the physiological negatives to this particular thing, and so the pressure drove this change. Out, outweighed the physiologic negatives? What do you mean? Well, the fact that, 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 that in the course of, of restructuring our face and jaw to make articulate, rapid, learned speech patterns, mm -hmm. uh, 
and we did that at risk to our uh, ability to breathe and swallow and uh, impacted wisdom teeth and a whole lot of other things that if you just looked at those things in isolation physiologically were not good. Not good. Collective <coughs> pressure for this social benefit of this communication far mm-hmm. outweighed the individual physiological negatives that got uh, pushed aside by the selective pressure driving language. You've been thinking about this a lot, haven't you? A little. Hmm. And, it, and I'm, so I was playing with that as, as a, a lens into how do these emotions work, mm-hmm. and particularly the ones <coughs> that um, seem to be most social. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so I, I'm going to rephrase a critical sentence there. Okay. The affects of interest, enjoyment, and shame. They're the major affects that monitor social activity and allow us to adjust to each other. I wish I'd said that. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, Would you like to take a wind break where I turn that on for a little bit? I'm fine. I'm fine, too. Okay. And please do regulate your own comfort. Mm. I don't deal much with comfort. I'm, I'm serious. I get on something and yeah, that's I where I am. Fine. It's one of the reasons as interns or residents we could literally stand 18 hours in the emergency room just working because that overrode everything. Yeah. And one of the reasons in battle someone can have a shattered arm and pay absolutely no attention to it till the battle's over, the danger's gone, then the arm hurts like hell. Right. Yeah, yeah. I understand it's wherever affect puts pushes us. Yeah. yeah. It changes the threshold. It's very much like we were talking about at dinner last night about the drugs and affecting our brain and where it mm-hmm. is, right? It's the threshold gets <clears throat> shifted so much. Yeah, that's right. So I have two things I want to make sure that we cover. There's two shame conversations. There's the one of um, there's this cognitive processing implications of the bandwidth dissipation of shame. The, the shame drives us towards um, reflecting on mm-hmm. thinking about, as you said earlier. Mm-hmm. And the brain's no longer just doing whatever it was doing. It's now busy doing that too. And so there's less processing bandwidth for whatever it was doing. And these things can so there, there's a processing consequence to shame. All right. There's, there's something in there <clears throat> where <clears throat> you're using a concept that comes much closer to your experience in the computer world than really fits what we know about affect. <clears throat> <clears throat> so your concept of bandwidth does not apply here, and I'd like to explain that to you. <clears throat> <clears throat> the evolved function of affect is to call our attention to, to maintain attention on whatever triggered it until we really begin to process what's there. So when any one of the nine affects is triggered, that occupies, the source of that affect occupies the totality of our thinking, of our attention. Attention without affect, <clears throat> try that again. <clears throat> <clears throat> Nothing becomes the source of our attention unless and until an affect is triggered. And when that affect is triggered, that's the only thing to which we can pay attention. We can multitask, it's true. But in multitasking, we do not maintain attention on each of the functions independently. What happens is we set up one action in the mind, it goes through, then we shift to another one, think about that, then we shift to another and think about that, And we're so alert to what's going on around us that we'll focus on whatever needs our attention next. 
So a multitasker isn't doing everything exactly at the same time. A multitasker is able to shift from one to another and keep a number of things available in mind at the same time. And yes, juggling from one to another. The more intelligent, the more able to multitask, the more things can be kept. <coughs> Part of the ability to multitask involves the ability, quite variable between people, to keep a number of balls in the air that we're juggling. Some people are lucky to keep one as the subject of their attention, lest they be distracted and that one thing they were paying attention to is gone. Other people can maintain rapt interest in two, three, five, six separate topics, shifting from one to the other intentionally to keep them going. That's what we mean by a multitasker. Did that make sense? It did. It didn't, didn't address. I mean, I, I think that I'm, <clears throat> by my sense of bandwidth, I don't mean to imply mm. that, um, that, there, that there's necessarily uh, concurrent processing, parallel processing going on. Oh. But I do mean to say that the capacity for how many things I can juggle, mm -hmm. how fast I can juggle them, because how many things you can juggle means how fast can I take care of this thing so that I'm freed up, I have more. Uh, in cycles, iterations, whatever you want to call it, to be doing item number two, item number three, item number four. Watch this one. Okay. Watch me carefully. The fingers never leave the hand. You ready? <clears throat> since, since both multitasking and attention deficit disorder involve an individual who is jumping from one source of interest to another, it's important to explain the difference between those two phenomena. In attention deficit disorder, the initial stimulus that had garnered our interest is gone. The individual can't maintain attention to that and maintain attention there. Attention, interest, the ability to process, is gone. Kids and adults with ADHD are unable to maintain secure attention on any topic that interests them. But a multitasker can maintain in mind each of the things that is interesting or fearful or triggers any affect and can deal with all of them, jumping from one to the other intentionally. In ADD, ADHD, the shift in attention is involuntary and unwanted. And that's a big difference between multitasking and attention deficit disorder. Since all attention is produced by affect, and there is no way for us to pay attention, save for affect, then any attentional disorder must be a matter of one of these nine affects. The study that I've done of ADD, ADHD convinces me that what happens is as the child becomes very interested in the new stimulus, something interrupts like that, and that interruption makes him her focus on something else, and I believe that the impediment, rephrase, I believe that what's happened to the child is that something has interfered with attention when the child really would have remained attentive to the first stimulus. And if you watch the behavior, I've videotaped and watch the behavior of kids with ADD, ADHD. What I see is when the shift from the primary or original subject of attention occurs, the first thing they do is they dip their head like this and turn away and then go to something else. Every symptom of ADHD I can demonstrate is 
one of the <clears throat> I can show you by watching videotapes that every symptom associated with ADHD is also associated with shame. And I don't think it's necessary to devise a new category called ADHD when you can see all the behavior as related to shame psychology. Incidentally, all the medicines used to treat ADD, ADHD, are also the medicines we use to help people who have biological disturbances causing constant shame experience. <clears throat> the triggering of shame affect can happen at a frequency that's faster than we are consciously aware of. Yes? No. The verb you use, the what of shame affect? The, the frequency. I mean, the, the shame can trigger, uh, the affect can trigger, <clears throat> can come on and off, so to speak faster than our conscious awareness can identify, recognize. I don't know that it can turn off, but the first thing that happens is that when shame affect is triggered by this impediment I mentioned before, it owns attention, it owns consciousness. It's true, we may recognize that something awful has happened and drag ourselves back to the initial stimulus. But that's learned behavior. Babies learning to walk. Mm -hmm. Great. Stretching them, move, move in, in to walk. They start to fall. Mm -hmm. right? Their interest in whatever was propelling the directionality of their movement in the walk now turned to whatever's going on to avoid the fall. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So in the first instance, when it <clears throat> fell out of the intention to move in the direction they were going, there was some shame. Not necessarily. Okay, good. This is what I want to get to. How, how not so? Well, remember the, the condition we establish for the shame physiology is that something remains interesting or remains enjoyable, and there's an impediment to our continued connection with that stimulus. But when there's a thunderclap, we're now involved entirely with that as the new triggered affect. When we start to fall, we develop a moment of fear because we're falling. So we're no longer aware of thinking about, stimulated by the task of climbing the stairs or walking that we've been doing before. So each affect, as it occurs, owns consciousness. In order to have shame affect, we must remain intrigued by the preceding stimulus, and there's an impediment. When the child's falling, that's all there is. The child is no longer involved with the, the interesting walk or going toward something else. Attention is now owned by whatever is associated with falling. At some point between there, okay. Sometimes between there and the more complex multitasking that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. which involves a different kind of um, time management than this um, only present single binary progression that you just described. And what you're saying in that last instance is that the moment they go into the fall, then there's a new affect, there's a new new dimension of reality, the intention to go wherever they were going before and all the interest associated with that is no longer occupying their attention. Their attention is on the fall, the fear, and so their, the shame in relation to their intended destination or whatever they were doing before doesn't come in because that got obliterated by the fear. By the new stimulus. By the new stimulus. Tompkins introduced the concept of scene. And a scene is 
the sequence of a stimulus, affect, and response. Back in 1938, a psychologist named Maurer introduced the concept of stimulus response, and we talked in psychology about SR pairs. But that was wrong. In an advanced organism like the human, there is no response to a stimulus unless it triggers an affect. So, if the stimulus is the interest in walking, and the pleasure of walking, and the pride of, of walking, if that's the stimulus, it, it owns the baby as it solves all the problems associated with putting one foot in front of another and walking. But as soon as falling occurs, a new scene takes place. A new stimulus, a new affect, a new response. It's gone. Again, what I'm saying is, is that, that that's suggesting this very <clears throat> narrow sequential linearity of this, then this, then this, then this, rather than this um, this juggling multiplicity that, though it's still happening one at a time, is happening in this aggregate collective um, <clears throat> flow in time. But I can't let you shift from, let's say, a 10 month old walking. To a forty-year-old who's multitasking. Agree. I just want to. I want to. I want to describe the fact that there is this spectrum. Well, no matter how old we are, we're going to have these nine affects. And if a, a trigger, if a stimulus occurs, and we pay any attention to it. That attention will have been produced because an affect was turned on. Any one of the nine affects, the two that feel good, startle, which is just a reset button, and the six that feel different kinds of awful. That gets our attention. We can have angry attention, sobbing attention, excited attention. Doesn't matter. The multitasker is able to shift her attention among a number of interesting topics and deal with each one of them. One of the most celebrated multitaskers of our time was President Clinton. I remember sitting not far from him as I watched him deliver a speech. And I could see that he delivered a paragraph that was already in his mind, he delivered it to the part of the mind that's ready to speak, and he spoke it. And you could see he was thinking about somebody else. You could see he was thinking about something else while his mouth delivered the words he was saying. And then everybody used to comment that he, but he bit his lower lip. And he would bite his lower lip when the paragraph was over to bring his attention back to what was going to be next in the speech he would say it and then go back to um <clears throat> and then go back to the uh other work he was doing he didn't have time if you will to be merely there in the speech now it happens that at the time i was uh, with him i was in that audience the protests in seattle over something to do with the world bank had gotten so out of hand that federal marshals either were called in or were about to be called in. So he was deeply involved with what was happening 3,000 miles away. But nobody in the audience would have known that because he was giving a wonderful speech about a good friend. So that's an example of a highly sophisticated and skilled multitasking. What we see in the infant is not skilled. It's physiologic and innate. There's a big difference between learning, assuming, owning skills, and being run by innate affect. Good. And what I'm trying to do is, is understand <clears throat> the bridge between the two. <clears throat> Take, for example, the learning to read process. Everything that we're finding out about the learning to read process is, is that the brain is involved in a multitude of different processing activities that all have to happen and concur together in a very uh, rapid 
Uh, I mean, the difference between the time that the eye recognizes a letter on average and the time that the sound image comes in and bundles up behind this letter for 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds, mm -hmm. right? And getting the sound and the image to line up in the brain is a process that um, in loops through comprehensional memory, what I've already read, and what kind of predictive participatory <coughs> uh, information that that's providing me. It goes through the graphing phonological um, disambiguation process. I mean, there are many different concurrent processing loops happening all together that are punctuating in and out in 15 <coughs> milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So, any one of these things can break down and cause the whole thing to drop out. Mm -hmm. right. There's an issue you are right on the edge of that needs to be dealt Good with. Go. Learning to read is a process that occurs in the neocortical brain the last evolved section of our complex three brains. Well, affect is a very primitive part of the subcortical brain. All affect deals with is the rate and speed at which things are happening in the brain. If we're looking at something and intensely interested in it, there's a certain gradation of neural firing we believe triggers interest. If there's a sudden loud noise, or a book is clapped, that sudden noise triggers startle, the range from surprise to startle. The affect system doesn't care what triggers it, but the neocortical system does care, and caring, of course, is handled by affect, because caring means that affect gets associated with a process but they're independent parts of the brain. The processing in milliseconds of <clears throat> the millisecond duration processes you describe in reading are all things happening in the neocortical brain. They do trigger affect and are associated with affect, but they're completely different brain systems. <clears throat> yeah, that's clear to me. The question is, how fast can shame react to confusion or dropout in one of these sub uh, processes that are happening in the um, cognitive processes that we're describing? So let's say I'm cooking along, I'm really interested in all this stuff, and all of a sudden, I, my attention starts dropping out because one of these one of these confusions. I didn't get worked out fast enough on one of these multi-tracks of cognitive processing that's involved in meaning making out of those codes. So, so this is happening at this, like I said, 25, 30 milliseconds, and I can start dropping out. Mm -hmm. uh, at, the moment, at the moment dropping out occurs, shame affect will be triggered. So, yes, millisecond duration changes can trigger any affect. Associated with any problem in reading can be a number of affects. There can be fear, because I'm going to get yelled at by the teacher. Most likely what's going to happen is shame, because I've been interested in what's on that page, and oh, all of a sudden it makes no sense to me. The fact that it makes no sense the decision, the neocortical interpretation that I can't do this, that is associated with the affect shame. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I've seen in children learning to read, you see them with a face of interest, track, look, listen, eyebrows down, eyes focused, looking like this, head forward. Then you see them slump for a moment when they can't get something, and then they're going to have one of a number of reactions to shame. But it's that range from interest 
to shame that's critical in the process of learning to read. Very few of the people who've studied reading have paid attention to the importance of shame triggered by failure to understand the code and shame, therefore, producing this cognitive shock I've described, making it literally impossible to continue reading until that shame affect has waned and interest can be resumed in the process of learning to read. So what you Left on the tape? Yes. Let's change it. <clears throat> get up and take a, take a little spinning around and come back to this point. Is that good? What point? I don't remember. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. scanned rather than 30 interlaced. Mm. So it's, it's got uh, higher resolution and uh, turn it into standard. Anyway, <clears throat> what we were talking about, what's, what, what's so important, Don, is, is we talk to these people, these literacy leaders and these education leaders, let me, let me draw you a little bit of a sense of who's at the party with us here that may not be obvious. And some of the things they already know and what they don't know that I'm driving our conversation towards. Mm -hmm. They already know that, 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 sh that the kind of first big obvious consequence is shame. Mm -hmm. They know that there's a, a direct correspondence between all the social pathological stuff mm -hmm. and the shame. Mm -hmm. They're getting that. It's clear. Wendorf's got that. He did a great job of describing it. You know, the, the kids are... And adults, they feel so bad about themselves because of this, right, that it's leading to all kinds of social pathology. I mean, it's pretty clear on that. The stories that come out of talking with these literacy readers of the incredible dimension <coughs> hide this. You know, so there's one side of this that's really clear. You know? But they don't, they, they think they think that this shame and the negative to self-esteem, the self-esteem damage associated with reading, is this um, downstream consequence. I don't think they understand shame's of play in the process of reading in the way that we're beginning to approach. Oh. Right? That's why I'm coming back to this. It was, They're dealing with emotion shame instead of affect shame. Exactly. <coughs> the more that we connect with them, then we start to draw the cognitive scientists into this conversation in a different way. Because mm -hmm. they, the cognitive scientists are saying very clearly, man, the brain's that red line. It's trying to juggle more things than it possibly can to make this thing work. It's bandwidth constrained. <coughs> <coughs> David, are any of the scientists you're talking to using MRI technique to evaluate what's in the brain? <coughs> Shaywitz and Talal. And oh, Paula Talal is brilliant. Yeah. Um, now. <coughs> 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 <clears throat> I'd like to have my voice back. If you see it, will you tell it to come home? Thank you. And we'll just wait for it. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Um. <clears throat> One of the things that's puzzled me about the modern study of cognition is that a lot of work is being done with MRI 
and fMRI, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Now, it's true that because of this wonderful technology, we can see what's going on in various places in the brain. But to me, the great pity, the great shame, if you will, is that no one's taking videotape footage of the face of the individual who's in the MRI um, machine. You see, all affect is read out first on the face. If you see a, a child who's unable to uh, continue a cognitive exercise, the child goes like this, that's shame. It's not bandwidth. It's not something uh, over-processing in the neocortex. It's shame affect. But unless you look at the face while this is going on, or to rephrase that, unless while you're studying cognitive process, you maintain close attention to the face, then you're missing a huge amount of data that must be taken into taken into <clears throat> account. Yes. <clears throat> so let me, let me just say it. Un unless you're videotaping the face while you're doing MRIs to show what's going on during cognition, unless you're videotaping the face and studying those videotapes in association with the MRI data, you're not taking into account the affective dimension of cognitive process. And remember, no cognition is begun or maintained until an affect says it's needed. <clears throat> One of the things that we're going to set up is, is actually, I don't know whether you can do this with MRI or fMRI in terms of reading watching the face on video and doing the scan. You can certainly do this with evoked potential. There's people that are using evoked, 128 sensor evoked potential mm -hmm. systems. <clears throat> They're tracking the movement around. We, 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 were, we just filmed a, a little piece of the study going around in Louisville when we were down there that involved that kind of technology. That kind of technology they could. I think it would be great. I think it's critical that somebody show the brain processing correspondence of facial affect display, that you can see it, that they register together, that they can start to map that internal process with this external process so they can see it and co-register it with other things that we're trying to track. I can't imagine that it would be very difficult to have videotape footage of any subject wearing the skull cap you're describing for um, evoked potential. Secondly, although I am not really up to speed on evoked potential work, I do believe it mostly monitors neocortical function. When I'm talking about affect, I'm talking about a pure subcortical function that has radiation, that has expression, wrong word, <clears throat> a purely subcortical function that sends messages to lots of neocortical loci, the forebrain, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. These affects cause things to happen all over the brain. We believe that the first thing the affect does when triggered is to be responsible for a display on the face. But I don't think that you can show with evoked potential what happens when an affect is triggered because I believe that it occurs in a very primitive part of the brain called the ventral striatum, which I don't think is picked up on evoked potential. So you may not be able to see, see the brain itself processing the object, but you may be able to see a correlation between what the brain was doing in processing, for example, reading, the effect of shame kicking on the face right. and the disruption to that process you were tracking. Exactly. So that you could see the signature of shame interrupting the processing of reading. That's exactly right. I know somebody that can probably help get that funded. I, I, that, hmm? 
Well, I think that that's the kind of thing that does fit inside what what Lion and uh, Tiger Dennis and uh, the, the the guy that's doing the existing system. Now they're looking for how can they, obviously they took on this project with the glasses, right? They're looking for how can they leverage their setup and find out more about the reading process. What we're talking about is a simple, virtually low cost. Uh, addition to the things they're already doing now, which is to add this video thing and co-register that information, data overlay it in time with what they're picking up on the evoke potential to see whether or not this correspondence exists. And if it does, it creates a, a research base, a foundation base to pull them into this, this kind of work more. I can, with relative ease, find those researchers people who are extraordinarily skilled at reading micro reactions on the face. Good. And <clears throat> the faster the speed of getting the data from the face, the more you can show um, minuscule reactions. Tompkins, back in the 60s, <clears throat> had a device that would take 5,000 frames a second. He said it went off like a cannon, and therefore it produced startle after what it was uh, meant to study. But you could see shifts in facial muscle display, kind of like when you slow down a tape or a record. And there was an enormous amount of data there. This really fascinates me. The closer we get, people understand. So one of the things that we're trying to say and communicate with the people that we're communicating with is that the general issue, like we touched on last night, is that, um, well, let me back up from that. Let's go back to the point. Somebody's had shame, even in this, this high frequency range that we were talking about before mm -hmm. the break. Okay? Now, <clears throat> tell me how it is that the more that we that we experience shame, or the more that shame triggers in conjunction with some particular thing we're doing, how that affects the threshold of shame triggering. In other words, the more that I experience shame, um, you know, picking my fingernail, the more easy it's going to be for me to experience shame picking my fingernail, or whatever it is that I'm doing. Is there, is there a decrease in the threshold of shame triggering that is a consequence of shame triggering more frequently? Is it looped that way? What can you say about that? Often when we talk about learning, we think only of the neocortical processes involved. How are ideas and facts stored? How do we retrieve them? How do we associate them? What's rarely studied is that nothing is the subject of our attention until and unless an affect is triggered. Therefore, material is stored in the neocortex related to the affect that was associated with that storage process. Nevertheless, if you have what I call earlier a stimulus-affect response sequence, then this sequence, if it occurs many, many times. We group similar sequences on the basis of the affect involved and the scene involved. A family of scenes that are similar in some way. That family is a bundle of scenes. <clears throat> that family is a bundle of scenes to which we now develop an affective response. Instead of the affect being triggered by the specific experience or stimulus that it did before, now we have an affect that is triggered by the family of scenes. Let's say, for example, that we had shame affect associated with a process of trying to get the difference between the O-U-G-H sound in thought, through, uh, and all the other ways that that um, phoneme can appear. Well, what happens is that 
if all the OUGH experiences are bundled, and we come to understand that every time we can't decipher what OUGH means, and we have a shame experience every time we hit OUGH, then the bundle of scenes that contain OUGH failures triggers fear. Because now we have a script that says, OUGH is going to make me hurt, and I'm afraid of the specific hurt that we call shame. Therefore, failure to read any, failure to comprehend and stay with anything that happens during the learning to read process becomes a script in which we now have a completely different affect from the shame that's triggered with failure. We can become frightened of reading, disgusted by reading, angry at reading, any one of a number of affective responses. But that response will precede the next attempt to read. The um, <clears throat> scientists talk about wire and fire. Mm -hmm. the more, more frequently that neurons fire together, mm -hmm. the more that they are wiring together. And the more that they are wiring together, the easier it is for them to fire together. <clears throat> There's this... Um, <clears throat> snowballing of the likelihood of an incidence that comes from repetition. The more that it's happening, the easier it is for it to happen. Although, the, although neuroscientists deal often with the concept of fire and wire, and they tell us that the more often a, a tract is fired, the more likely we are to have wires that uh, become highways for that firing. What they've left out, because they don't study the face, they've left out the idea that it is affect that makes the bundles of thoughts. It is affect that makes the firing neurons become a wire, a group, a propensity, a proclivity. It's all responsible wrong. <clears throat> it's all a function of the affect associated with the experience you describe. Did that make sense? It makes sense to me. I don't know how much I can use it. I, mean, I understand that they don't get this, right? But mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to, I think they're going to get this because they get led into experiencing the correspondence in a way that opens the floodgates for them not because anybody says it's so, right? We have to create a situation where it's in their research interests to add certain dimensions to what they're doing, what they're monitoring, that reveals this to them. And then they'll, they'll pull themselves into this with a force. And my question, again, because this is what relates to reading, is, is that, 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 that if, in fact, we have a situation where the um, more that I feel confusion with reading, and the more that I start to uh, feel, uh, I go to the end. And my sense is, is that what's happening to children is that they're learning to have a faster than they're aware of it, um, aversion to the shame that they so they've learned to associate with feeling feeling confused. And what I'm suggesting to you is that. In our world of the psychology of affect, of the psychology of affect and script, we call the process you just described script formation. The aversion to reading then is a script that involves an affective reaction to a bundle of scenes in which reading has produced shame. So we have an aversion to whatever is going to produce that well-known, well-experienced uh, shame. And the, we have an aversion to what is going to produce this discomfort with such reliability. That's a script. 
and the script is <clears throat> the script is format formulating, <clears throat> developing, and becoming uh, easier. Uh, <clears throat> Let me go, because I know where you're going. <clears throat> There's a good part about scripts and a bad part about scripts. Scripts mean that we don't have to learn every experience anew. Scripts allow us to summate experiences and develop an approach or an attitude toward them. That's wonderful because we don't have to use our highest neocortical function every time a stimulus occurs. We know from experience what's going to happen. However, the bad part about a script is it makes it very difficult to take in novel data. It happens that scripts involve rules for the management of scenes. And if we've had enough bad experience reading, even though we may be shown a new way to read by a new teacher in a new situation, and it was really worth our while to pay strict attention to this new way, we may be motivated to pay no attention to it because we're certain we're going to have a bad experience. That's script formation. <clears throat> well, the pieces that I'm trying to get one is in a kind of simple language that the average parent and teacher can understand that the more that a child experiences shame doing X, that the easier it is for them to experience shame doing X. That the threshold lowers as the script and see, as the scene repeats, then the script <coughs> forms. Then, then, then uh, it becomes easier and easier to fall into shame doing that. The greater the number of the greater the number of experiences of reading, in which a child experiences shame the more likely it is that every experience of reading is going to be associated with the expectation of shame. So the ongoing experience of reading almost involves wariness of when is the shame going to occur and I know I can't read. As soon as that's happened, We've lost a valuable opportunity to teach children. We haven't recognized in modern pedagogy the experience of shame and how it prevents children from learning. As a matter of fact, most people believe that shame, that <clears throat> most people believe that you should feel shame, that it's good for you, that if you don't feel shame, there's something wrong with you, and that the shame should teach you to operate differently. That may be true in certain adult situations, but if every time a child tries to read and can't decipher the code, that child feels shame. You've decreased significantly the ability of that child to learn, to pay attention, to associate new data with previously stored data. You have a child who's going to give up, who is likely to give up on reading. If you look at what happens in a classroom, you'll often see children when a reading exercise comes up, begin to act differently. Not only is the child called upon, full of anticipatory, anticipatory shame, but all the other children around him or her, all the other children are worried they're going to be called on. So they start acting up, laughing, clapping, pounding their feet, 
doing things that discourage the teacher from continuing to pay attention to the reading lesson. Mel Levine said that every classroom is an arena of shame. You are exposed in front of your peers. You may be shown as less something or anything than they. And you are always in a fishbowl. Every classroom is an opportunity for humiliation. If our teachers don't learn from your work on reading, how important shame is as an interrupter of the learning process, then we lose more and more students every day. My sense is that this can generalize. What I mean by that is that the seed can go to a point where it breaks out of the context of reading and it's in relation to the feel of confusion. The feel of, of uh, <coughs> confusion. What happens to somebody <coughs> who starts to develop a shame aversion to the feel of confusion? It's gonna, it seems to me it's going to decapitate their learning. It's going to cut them off. And that's what seems to me to be the connection between reading and why it's, a, why it's such an unbelievable parallel um, statistically with every social pathology we monitor. Let's take the very idea of confusion. We think that confusion is entirely a neocortical cognitive process, but it isn't. Watch the face of a child or an adult who's confused. They turn, they turn away like this. Something's going on, and we believe that it's shame. There's no way that I know of to separate confusion from its accompanying affect. So any time we're confused, I believe, unless you can show me from videotape or film footage of the face, I believe that all confusion involves sh shame. Now, there's nothing wrong with being confused. Much that we're taught in school is not immediately intuitively perceptible. Of course we can't learn everything quickly. And the normal or healthiest child can accept that shame associated with the confusion and redouble the intentional interest to go back to study that until this child gets it. So early, our children divide into two streams. Those who know they can overcome shame and force attention to what's going on and then get the result they want a triumph, and those who say, it's not worth it, I don't want to have more pain. There must be ways that our teachers can be taught this, anticipate and understand this normal range of shame, and therefore educate our children much more easily to deal with reading. <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the things I'm really driving towards is, that, is I think um, well, I want to support what we were talking about earlier in terms of getting um, research or researchers, brain mind processing specialists to understand that they can't really understand what they're looking at unless they factor in, unless they understand affect. But throwing your book at them ain't doing the job, mm. right? So we've got to suggest research experiments that will give them traction and benefit in what they're already doing by opening this channel to their visibility. That's one thing. But the other thing, where all this leads to, to me, is, again, we are we're putting children in a situation which is radically, unnaturally confusing. 
naturally confusing in the sense that it's not like a sensory somatic activity that they've got feedback when this is hotter, this is colder, this hurts more than this, or this. <coughs> I can feel wind on my face. I can feel myself out of <coughs> balance as I'm dancing. There's none of that kind of proprioceptive feedback loops going on here. There's this virtualized processing environment that's dealing with this artificial code that's based on a couple thousand years of human, a few hundred years of human negligence that never existed before, that's never been processed sufficiently by the human brain over evolutionary time to develop the infrastructure to do it. And that kind of confusion that it's bringing about in children is causing them to feel that there's something wrong with them because they're confused. Well, let me try something. <coughs> <coughs> It's rare these days that a cognitive neuroscientist really considers the role of affect in learning. One of the reasons for this, I believe, is that the easiest place to study affect is in the face. If you just simply watch the face of a baby or a small child, you can see the affect course over that face rapidly. And the shift from one affect to another represents the shift from one source of attention, one stimulus, to another. But why don't we study it with adults? Well, everybody knows that adults can fake affect. They can smile when they feel awful. They can frown when they feel wonderful. We are capable of conscious control of our face. But here we're talking about small children who haven't really learned to disguise their facial display. It's in this cohort that we ought to be able to show the relation between the cognitive processes, the physiologic events taking place that can be seen on an fMRI, and what's on the face. Even in older people, even in adults, you can see a great deal on the face during an experimental situation. There's a taboo against looking at the face. We embarrass people when we stare at them. Everybody's afraid or has been socialized to believe that staring at somebody is not fair. And, not strangely, Neuroscientists and cognitive scientists are people too, and they've learned not to stare at the face. It takes a very special kind of ignorance, the willingness to ignore that taboo against staring at the face, in order to be able to do things like take film or videotape footage of the face during the experiments in question. It's not at all hard to do, it's not hard to find specialists who can interpret the facial display, and it's not hard at all to have a time check on the video footage that allows you to correlate it perfectly with what's seen in the um, electronic MRI image or the, the uh, um, evoked potential experiments. It's easy, it's rewarding. And the reason we don't do it is because there's a long-standing taboo against staring at people. Well, there's I, a... I think the pathway through this is for them to recognize <clears throat> that, that there is, this comes back to the, the bandwidth thing, and I understand <clears throat> the objection to that, but the idea that in order to understand a complex processing um, <clears throat> I won't say event, but in order to, to understand complex processing about a particular function or task, that it, it, that because shame plays such a powerful role in this, they've got to be able to see shame, and they've got to be able to see shame and its effect on this process. Because <clears throat> you can't point to them and say, all right, stick your scanner here, forget about the face, forget about the rest of it, and here's how you can sense shame. That's shame, signature distinction of shame. Right? You haven't got to that point. We don't have a, you don't have a, um, 
MRI system or any other kind of sensory system that can that can that can signature detect the the the, the, the distinct uh, behavioral activities in the brain in the lower brain of affect. It seems so strange that everybody's looking for a highly advanced electronic technique to demonstrate what's easily visible on the face. If you simply put thermocouples, heat-sensing um, gadgets, on the cheek, then it, that will detect a rapid rise in temperature. That's part of shame. We just see the downcast eyes. That's shame. The data's there, but it's external to the brain. But it's just as valid and occurs within microseconds of the event. I think the interesting point is, is that, <coughs> well, I agree with you, but, but the, the point is, how do we get the people <coughs> like Sally Shavers, <coughs> like Dennis Mulvies, like uh, Jack Fletcher, the people that are the leaders of the uh, Black College of Law, who have... Um, the equipment, the laboratories, <clears throat> and the implicitly the interest in the problem space of reading to connect the dots for us, coming from them. How do we inspire them to do that? How do we suggest the value of a research uh, activity that would be simple, inexpensive, and, and do that and, and result in what we want? What we want here. I think that part's. Um, well, let, let me let me address that. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometime in the mid fifties, when I was in medical school, I had the opportunity to work at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. That uh, became Rockefeller University later. And I had the honor of working with Vladimir Zworykin, one of the developers of television, and a group that was working on a new machine. It allowed you to use a color television screen, and since Zworykin was a vice president of RCA, he had one of the first and very large screen color TVs. And to pulse through a microscope with quartz optics, three different wavelengths of ultraviolet. That was converted by the, um, the guns of the color TV system to an image on the screen, which was actually differential absorption of ultraviolet radiation, and therefore living tissue could be seen stained as if it had been uh, uh, put, uh, killed, sliced, and stained on a microscope slide. Now, it turned out that this was an utterly useless piece of technology. Why doesn't matter. But we involved the Sloan Kettering Institute, New York Hospital for Cornell, Cornell Medical Center, and other scientists at the Rockefeller in getting specimens that we could examine. Why? Because it was a new machine. Every time a new machine is invented, we look for ways to use it. And right now, the darling of the biological sciences is the MRI, fMRI, CAT scan, and all this other equipment. It's wonderful because the most advanced minds in our field can justify the use of these wonderful machines, and they're finding out tremendous amounts of information. But that doesn't mean we have to let go of the information that can be derived from simple observation of the face. If you correlate what is obvious with what is previously invisible, there's a tremendous amount of learning that can go on, and that's all I'm talking about. I'm in complete agreement. <coughs> as far as we've got it, I mean, in one of the articles with Wentworth, uh, we talk about setting up a situation where we can see the book, we can see what they're reading, we can see their eyes track it, we can see their face as a whole as their effective display shifts in relation to their task, and that we're going to overlay on top of that an MRI that's showing the processing as best we can, mm -hmm. and overlay on top of that a kind of a dynamic flow schematic of the processes involved so that we can get this all-at-once picture 
of the code, the confusion in the code, the tracking with the code, the affective display, the perspective <coughs> of it, mm -hmm. what we can see with MRIs about processing it at the regional, global level, and then at, the, at a schematical overlay level. So that we're going to composite these things and allow us to move through them all in relation to a, a registered image of a real person reading, real child reading. Awesome. I'm on that. We're going awesome. to do that. Awesome. How can you have someone in an MRI machine? What do they have? Open MRIs now? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's the problem. See, we can take the. Um, we can't actually do all of what I've described with a real time synced MRI. Mm -hmm. Right? We can uh, take an MRI. Because, first of all, like <coughs> we talked about last night, these things are crude. Mm -hmm. Right? I couldn't agree more with you. This is like. You know, uh, Sufi keys, you know, Sufi lights, right? Right. And we've got a big machine that's got to tell us all the new stuff, so let's just keep looking at it, you know? But there is a limitation to what it can see, and it creates a box that we're looking in, mm -hmm. and it excludes everything that's not within its frame of reference and so forth. As we close, there's a couple of things that I want to make sure that we get. You said in the last interview that were really great, which it was, where well, you said with drama, um, wouldn't we be stupid to keep reading? You're talking about how reading evokes shame in the kids. Mm -hmm. And we've actually used <coughs> this book. And it's great. And it gets a wonderful crowd reaction. It pulls people in. And I don't know. I'm not trying to direct you. Mm -hmm. but just to refresh your memory. You're talking about shame, um, reading evoking shame. And then you lean forward and you say, well, wouldn't we be stupid to keep reading? Oh, once, once reading shame oh, watch, watch this, watch this. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to use what Corey said in, in an interesting way. <clears throat> Just because a child has difficulty reading doesn't mean that the child is stupid. If every experience of reading produces shame and the child learns quite well, not how to read, but learns quite well that shame accompanies reading. Wouldn't a child be stupid to continue approaching reading when that child is going to have a tremendous experience of shame by reading? <clears throat> Put it, rewind it, and just see if that's okay. Because I, I can do it again and better. Do it again, do it again. Anyway, and this is <coughs> short. <coughs> bang bang. Um, <coughs> once shame <coughs> and reading doesn't have to be every time. I don't want to over over generalize mm -hmm. it every time. But the more that shame <coughs> got it, it's a reliable shame. trigger for yeah, shame. Once there's such a thing like this, wouldn't it be mm -hmm. stupid to keep doing something that you feel like feel bad about yourself when you do? Mm -hmm. If not every time a child reads, but reliably every once in a while when a child reads, that child experiences shame. And that feels awful. And that codes reading as a powerful source of shame. Wouldn't a child be stupid to voluntarily do something that's going to humiliate him? Anything else that you can think of? So, Don, imagine that. we've got 50 people we're talking to, well placed mm -hmm. in different dimensions of this throughout the, the leadership, literacy organizations, government, <coughs> scientists, and so forth. And basically, like I was saying, there's just two parts of the story to get. Mm -hmm. Unnatural confusion, shame. Well, reasonable confusion because the code is bad. It's, it's exacerbated by the fact that the whole idea of code processing, <clears throat> this kind of code processing, mm -hmm. is unnatural. But this particular code is the result of uh, 23 scribes and a couple hundred of their assistants in 1530, 14, excuse me, 1440, right? 
when King Henry V needed to develop this language system, none of these people cared about English. English was a peasant language. Hmm. Right? They developed a code that was based on preserving the primacy and supremacy of Latin and French and other languages that they grew up in. They didn't even hear English. And they developed a transcription system to communicate with the peasants who spoke English. Fused other things onto it. Now, 500 years later, 100 million people are suffering because learning this thing is incredibly confusing and because they blame themselves for that confusion. Cut something. Let's just play with this. If we use modern economic logic, nobody could have made money selling the writing of English. Because when it was started in the 16th, uh, 1430, <clears throat> if we use economic logic, nobody could have made money selling English writing, English spelling, English reading, because it doesn't work very well. Now, 500 years later, more than 500 years later, we can't sell this product to little kids, and we can't get them interested in reading because the code doesn't make sense. If we just go about it in sheer economic terms, a product that was developed in the mid-15th century doesn't work today. Every other product in our culture that doesn't work today has been replaced by one that works better, except for reading. <clears throat> um, let's shut down the lights so we can talk a little bit more as they're mm -hmm. cooling. Is that all right? Yeah. Is there anything else that you think we should touch on that we have? <clears throat> We've dealt with the fact that affect is necessary for all attention yes. and that neocortical cognition doesn't get uh, pulled in until and unless an affect is triggered. Right. If the affect is shame, then continuing to focus on the trigger we will remain confused and we will remain unable to think clearly. The interesting thing about what you've said about the sh about shame and how it relates to this is, is that it's like when shame comes in, all of a sudden there's, there's a, um, a reflective loop that's, that's an equivalent asking what, what, what's going on, what's mm -hmm. wrong here. Mm -hmm. Some kind of a uh, <clears throat> examination of <clears throat> what caused the dropout. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> Come back. <clears throat> In most situations, when an affect is triggered, we pay strict attention to whatever triggered the affect. But when shame is triggered, we pay strict attention to what might be wrong with us. Therefore, failures in learning to read become one of the big sources of a shame-based personality. These days, Shame is no longer registered the way it was 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. Shame doesn't produce deference and withdrawal. These days, shame is handled by the public, from children to adults, by avoidance behaviors, making noise, clowning, later on in life taking drugs and alcohol. Or it's handled by being aggressive angry, fighting with someone, showing that you're better than somebody else. So whereas it may be that a long time ago, shame would make someone docile and willing to do what you told them. Nowadays, if something reliably triggers shame, it's going to prevent learning, and it's going to make someone shy away from what triggered shame. It's a bad deal to trigger shame these days if you want someone to think and learn. I'm happy. I know there's pieces scattered all over the place, but that's the way this seems to work. Mm. I think it's really good stuff. It's the background. But the main thing that I'm trying to do is to take everybody's description of shame. I mean, this kid was ashamed. They wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do that. These prisoners, <clears throat> prisoners would, would get up and read, but they, before they get up and read, they tell the rest of the prisoners that are listening, if I don't read well, it's because I don't want to read well. Mm -hmm. Right? Or the little kid says, reading's not that important. Mm -hmm. Or, 
I'm not a good reader. Right? Or the mother who, like we were saying last night, as the kids come home from school, she's always busy. So that when they bring her papers to read, she can say to the children, oh, just set them over there. I'll get to them later. Right? So that she's never put in a situation where the kids find out she can't read. And the stories go on and on and on, Don. And what I want to be able to do is to ground those stories here. So that people have an understanding that this isn't just a secondary, you know, tertiary, <coughs> downstream consequence. This shame thing is right back at the root. In the process itself. In the process of the processing itself. Okay. You'll, you'll probably cut the beginning of the statement, but you'll see the logic. Was it Nancy Reagan who came out with Just Say No to Drugs? A few years ago, President Reagan's wife, Nancy, launched a campaign that said, just say no to drugs. It didn't work very well because the reasons people took drugs were more affective than cognitive. So they felt they needed drugs, and yes, they suffered the indignity of using drugs when they'd been told not to by the First Lady. Not long ago, a similar thing happened when a number of organizations put out a program called RIF, Reading is Fundamental. If reading is fundamental, and I can't read no matter what I do, then my humiliation rises constantly, because everywhere I go, I'll hear that reading is fundamental, and I can't read. So the system itself, reading is fundamental, unfortunately increased the shame load of a tremendous number of children who found themselves unable to read because their minds can't decode something that was really put together in the 1400s and doesn't work in the 2000s. And here's the other point that I'm really trying to get you <clears throat> that code equals to the need to help children work through the confusion of the code. We've got to contextualize the environment they're working in so as to minimize their tendency to blame themselves and so as to reduce the shame. Because the more frequently that they're having a shame experience, the more that it's retarding their learning to read process. Okay. And they're inextricably linked. Damn it. There was something you did when we were in Washington that we forgot to do now. So <clears throat> David has just asked me, well, what can a teacher do to prevent this? <clears throat> it's not hard to deal with or minimize the shame felt by a kid who can't read. All the teacher has to do is to say, you know, it really is confusing and it feels awful when you can't figure it out. Let's do it together. Teacher could say, boy, I had trouble with that when I was in school. Let me show you how it works. A teacher can say, don't, don't laugh. This is really difficult to get. I'm glad some of you pick it up easily, but it really is difficult. Come on, let's all work together and get this one. When you do that, it, um, it fits that line of pogos from years ago. We have met the enemy, and he is us. Every one of us has shame. Every one of us has periods of confusion. And if we tell everybody it's normal to feel confused, and it's normal to have shame when this goes on, then we can teach reading a lot better. That's, hmm? That's great. <clears throat> I would have been so pissed if I remembered this while you were in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. There are parts of the other one I can use in a pinch of the other presentations. Um, I feel good about this, though. I feel good about the research. And if you share it with where I'm going, I mean, there's no question that we've got to get Yeah, let's get used to that. Those are the problems, right?